Hello. Today I thought I'd show you how I, some of the process that I go through when I'm designing a quilt. Um, and so I've been having these ideas. Uh, you, some of you may realise that I've been travelling lately in the UK, uh, living on a canal boat. And the canals in the UK, uh, as I'm sure in other places too, have locks. What the lock does is it creates um, the ability for the, the water to step up and down with the terrain. So with a river it just kind of runs downhill but locks don't work that way we were trying to go through them but this isn't all about locks this is more about the lock gates the lock gates in some cases can be in my opinion really beautiful this is a picture I've got here of a lock gate um, it's, it's part of a pair of gates and these are the gates that open to let the water up and down and the boats accordingly up and down and things as well but what I really like about them is just that their, their shape is appealing I like this particular one, some of them look a little bit different to this, um, with its bars across in the way of its construction, plus also it's got all this greenery, the foliage growing on it, um, probably weeds, but nonetheless in my opinion very attractive. And so I had had this idea that I might like to do something with a lock gate for a quilt. And then I have got these wonderful fabrics here, I've got this lovely range of fabrics, um, this is a little bundle uh, of fat eighths from Oakshot Fabrics so and they have a website oakshotfabrics.com and they do these wonderful cottons and they're shot which means that there's kind of two colors in the weaving and so that when they catch the light they kind of just really glow and I just think that they're so exciting and this is a little bundle of fat eights called New Forest which to me just kind of went together with my idea for the lock gates so I've kind of come up with an idea of doing something that's inspired by a lock gate somewhat simplistic compared to the actual thing so this is my lock gate idea and then I've gone to my piece of paper which I do I do a lot of work with a pencil and paper and I've drawn up something that vaguely resembles a lock gate and some ideas for some possible foliage very rough ideas at this stage uh, made some notes and things about what sizes I might do and then I've gone to my computer I have a program on my computer called EQ7 and I've drawn up just the basis using my ideas and notes for sizing. I've drawn up a very basic plan for my lock gate. Um, so it's not going to be very large, it's going to be somewhere in the region of 15 inches by 18 inches, just a nice wall hanging. Because remember I'm working with fat eighths so some of the pieces um, are not going to go a long way and I was wanting something to work for the borders and things. So what I've drawn up here is just using a couple of the colours that I've got here for my timber gate that's in stripes going up and down um, where I've got a little dark bit here, I've got a dark, slightly darker shade. This main green, these colours are not true to colour, will be this sort of murky colour and then I've got these wonderful little bits and pieces here that will do for the foliage on top and to me those colours just work so well together that it just was going to happen. So after I've done, I've got a photo here, I don't always work from photos but this particular instance it just seemed to be a good idea. So I've got my photo, I've got a rough drawing, I've got my plan from my EQ7 and then I've written some notes about cutting and various things like that. So I'm showing you this as I'm doing it so I can't show you the whole quilt just yet but you will see it shortly. Um, so I'm going to go away and do some cutting and I'll show you the next part of the pro process as I get to it. So I've been busy cutting out my delicious oak shot fabrics. So the fat eights that were in the bundle are quite large because the oak shot fabrics are extra wide. So a fat eighth is approximately 10 inches wide by 27 inches long. So that's really good. So we've got plenty of fabric to work with. So I've been cutting some strips. So on the cutting instructions, and yours might not look quite like this because I'm still working through it, um, I've suggested that you do things with the different colours. So I've suggested with the darkest rust um, that we might do that also for the binding. So I've popped that darker rust colour around the edge for my binding. It's also in the quilt as well, but it's not part of these vertical stripes. So for the darker rust though, I've suggested that we cut out um, a couple of one inch strips they're going to actually we need three 
it says on your notes anyway, you'll be able to see what it says. You should be able to get two out of one strip, but we actually need three, uh, need to cut two off to get the three out of it. And also I've suggested cutting the binding strips, which I'm suggesting are two and a quarter inches wide. And you need three of those. The, the length of the fat eighth should be enough then. So that that's the binding already cut. A couple of strips. Then from the two other rusty colours, I've suggested that we cut some one and a half inch wide strips. They're 15 inches long. You need six of each colour. Um, and that's going to form the background area of our hanging. We're going to join those together, but I'll just quickly run through the cutting before I go any further. From the darkest green, now because the fabric is 10, 10 inches wide, and it's pretty good on being 10, I've cut five two inch strips from it. Um, if yours isn't quite, because it probably could be just under, if you join up your strips you'll still have enough length. Um, so initially if you can get the five two inch strips out that's great. If you can't, you'll need enough length to cut um, to be able to cut out the strips according to the pattern here. And then from your medium sort of green, again, like the very dark rust one, we need a couple of one inch strips that are going to be used later. So most of that can be put aside um, for later. It was just sort of a bit of preparatory cutting. And then to start sewing, I'm going to start by doing the background, which is these joined up strips uh, in here. And so we're just going to alternate these two colours. So these are cut one and a half inches wide by 15 inches long. And I'm just going to join them all up just with a quarter of an inch seam. All the seam allowance have been included in the pattern and it's all for a quarter inch seam allowance. So I'm just going to join all these in a row um, so that they're all one nice piece of fabric, stripy fabric. Um, so I'll go and get that done and then I'll show you the next bit. So I've been busy sewing my strips together to give me a nice kind of striped background of those two rusty colours. So they don't really stand out a lot against each other but that's what I was looking for this time so that's really great. Now on the back as you can see I pressed all my seams open and this is because we're wanting it to sit nice and flat this time I don't really want the ridges that a seam might form. So I've pressed all those seams open and I've trimmed my piece it should be 12 and a half inches wide like it, it should just be 12 and a half inches with your seams are right and I've just trimmed it to 14 and a half inches long which is the size we're looking for and then I've got my backing and batting which in the list of um, needs and things I've suggested that you might um, have a piece of bat batting and backing about the same size and I think they were about 17 inches by 20 inches. So I've laid those two together, the backing and the batting, and I've just used a cotton batting. This is a warm and natural um, cotton batting which is lovely to use. It sits nice and flat and it kind of clings to the fabric quite nicely. So that all works really well. And then I'm laying my stripe piece that I've just made on top of that, so we've got the backing right side down, then the batting, then right side up, because we're pretty much quilting as we go with this. Um, rather than coming back and quilting it all later, we're going to quilt it and then add to it. And so it's a little bit of fun. So I've laid that so that there's probably a little bit more top and bottom than there is on the sides, and that's because that's how we need it for the pattern. But there should be a few inches around the edge. And now I'm just going to quilt in straight lines. I'm just using a neutral grey thread which will show up a little bit on here. You could use different matching colours if you wanted to. I've chosen to go with the grey. I think it will work for what I'm doing. Um, and I'm just going to do parallel lines, maybe like three in, within each strip or something like that until I get there. I'm not absolutely sure. So I've got my walking foot on. Oh, you may want to put a couple of pins in just to make sure that doesn't move. They could be ordinary pins or they could be safety pins. Just something to stop it moving around because you want to keep that fairly straight if you can because we're using these edges like we would normally piece all this and then quilt it. Well we're quilting it but we're trying to keep it all straight. Bit of a challenge. I'm going to start in the middle somewhere just on one of the strips and I'll just do a little bit of this and then you can come back and do something else later. So I'm just going to come just to one side of the seam not in the ditch just a little bit, maybe an eighth of an inch to the side of the seam, all the way down. And when you're using a walking foot, you just let it feed it through. You don't 
want to put any pressure on it. Looking good so far. And I might do... We'll just work on one strip at the moment just to get a positioning right. I'm just doing now an eighth of an inch the other from the other seam, from the other end of the side of that strip. Just do one strip now, once another one right down in between, down the middle. So position your foot so it sits centrally on your strip, and sew another line of sewing straight down the middle there. This thread I'm using is an Aurifil, it's a delicious thread, it's slightly finer than other sewing thread, but it's all cotton. say it quilts and pieces and does everything beautifully. There, so I've done three lines of sewing in that strip and so I'm going to continue on doing the same exactly the same in all the strips. Now if you preferred you could make them slightly more irregular or you could do something else but this is really just a background it's not really going to show a lot but I just wanted it to sit nice and flat. So I'll continue on doing all that and then I'll come back and show you the next bit. So I've done all my quilting. I've quilted all the lines as I showed you when I was getting started and I'm really pleased with the way it's looking. It's sitting nice and square. I've actually given it a quick press with this cotton batting. You can do that. I've trimmed off any threads that I had at the end of my sewing lines and it's all sitting nicely. Now remember this is your backing so we have to keep this looking as nice and tidy as we can. There will be odd little bits and pieces that will overlap but in the scale of things it's a kind of a good way to do this project. So that's all sitting nicely, nice and flat, nice and straight. And now in your pattern it will tell you that I wanted you to, to draw some lines because we now need to mark where the crossbars go on my lock gate. So on my ruler here, I'm going to use the ruler. We, it tells you in the pattern that we've got to draw a line four inches down from the top edge. So this is my top edge over here. So I'm going to lay my ruler on so that the four inch in line sits right on that raw edge up there. And I've got a chalk marking pencil here. And I'm just going to draw a line right the way across so that I can see it there. And then we've got to do another line that's just an inch and a half that's line A. So you could mark that on the side if you like or put a sticker on it. Then we're going to, to do another line that's one and a half inches down from that. And so if you look at this disappear, the picture, you can see that what we're, we're marking is where these cross members and things are going overall. So we're just going to mark that was now so it was now an inch and a half from that first line. So this is now line B. These little chalk markers are really good. And then we had to go three and a half inches from that one. So that's the gap in between again. So one, two, three and a half. So lay that three and a half right over the top of that last line that you drew. And do another line. And that's going to be line C. It tells you all this in your instructions. And then you want to do another one that's one and a half inches from there. And that's going to be your line D. And then you should have a four inch gap below that again. So I'm not sure if you can see that. The lines, I can see them fairly clearly. They may not be strong enough for you to see, but I've got two lines here and here basically they're an inch and a half apart there's a four inch gap at each end and a three and a half inch in the middle so if you can get something to mark that we're going to be sewing things over the top of those lines um, but I have used a chalk marking pencil which will largely disappear 
so that would be quite helpful and then we're going to have a little bit of fun with some foliage but for now we'll just get to that point and then I'll show you the next bit so we're going to have a little bit of fun with the, the green foliage if you remember on our lock gate we've got these bars going across and we've drawn lines already on our piece of work ready for those bars to go across but we're going to do the greenery first or the foliage as I call it um, and it tends to sort of sit on these bars here so this is going to be a little bit of fun this is where we can get really creative so to get started we're going to do some little blades of grass now we're going to wire them so I'm just going to bring the iron in close here I've cut out some squares and the pattern will tell you all this um, some four inch squares of the fabric I've got a couple of different greens and I've got a piece of the the heat and bond light so I'm just going to iron the heat and bond to the back of one of the squares to start with and then I've cut some of the wire now we had some bits of wire it's like a florist wire that I've got here I'll just show you a piece they come in a variety of different things. Sometimes they're green. These ones happen to be white. It's just a soft wire. So a craft wire of some sort will do. It's just to give a little bit of body and strength to our, our green leaves and things. So I've got that ironed nicely on there. And so I've cut some lengths. This is for some blades of grass. I've cut some lengths of wire here already. Now, to cut this wire, it's not really a big deal. Don't use your best scissors but just some household or any or, or wire cutter type things of course will work but uh, not your best scissors but it's not hard to cut now I'm just going to peel off the paper so I've got the glue side on the back of my piece of fabric there and as I said this is really just playing the, the pieces of wire we're just going to lay these on top because we're going to sandwich them in between the two bits of fabric and I've cut them slightly different lengths um, it's not really important exactly what length they are. A variety is quite good, but they can be shortened a little bit later when we um, pop, pop the grass in where it goes. Um, so I'm just going to lay those in between, just space them out. Um, I wouldn't suggest working on anything any smaller than a 4 inch square because we're going to be free motion sewing and it just gets too hard to handle. So I've got them just sitting on top of the glue backing and now I'm going to lay the other square on top and I'm just going to hold the iron on that and let that bond with the wire in between this is such a fun process for making leaves and flowers or anything that you want to give a little bit of strength to and I'm just going to turn it over you can probably see that there's some little bumps you can see where the wire is which is helpful you want to be able to see the wire get that to press nice and firmly and then with my pencil and I'm just using one of these mechanical pencils I use these all the time I'm just going to trace you don't want anything too dark don't go getting a great big fat black marking pen because it, this mark, whatever you mark with now is going to stay on there but we are going to be stitching over it so I'm just going to run that pencil right up right next to the wire as if it was going to be in a little tiny channel and I'm just going to do that around all five of these so you just don't really need a strong marking it just helps reinforce where that wire is and where we're going to stitch and don't be worried about this this if you go and look at the grass outside the blades are all a little bit different so you don't have to have anything matching particularly you don't have to be too fussy because it will work in the end. The wire will help because we can bend it and twist it with the wire in it. You'll be amazed how clever you are when you've done all this. So now I've got all my, you can possibly see I've just outlined, drawn around each piece of wire and I'm going to go, I'm all set up for free motion sewing. I've dropped my feed teeth, I've got my free motion foot on and I'm just going to um, do some sewing around that. Because we've got that heat and bond in there, there's enough body in that that we can just sew straight onto that. So just on your drawn line I'm going to come up on the side of that wire next to the wire 
And don't panic about your stitching. This is just meant to be a fun, creative little episode. Now I've gone round the top and I'm coming all the way back down the other side. I'm just using the one thread for everything. I decided at the beginning of the project that one thread was going to be good for everything. So it's a nice grey, it's an aurifil thread. They're lovely to work with, a 50 weight. And I'm doing around this bit of wire twice. Again, don't panic if your stitching isn't exact. This is a creative type of sewing. And I'm going to come up with the next one. Don't panic if you're not right on top of your line. In fact, this is a, definitely a no panic sewing. And again, around it a second time. If you wobble off, just come back on again. Tremendous fun. And just one more to go. done five blades of grass. Now you can do as much grass of course as you like but I thought we'd start with five. I'm probably going to do five for each layer. I didn't want to have too much grass um, so probably three lots of these squares and if you do different colours either side with the, with the different greens and the yellow, there's another couple of colours here, um, then you can have this nice variety of, of colours of grass. So I've done all that to that point now, and I'm just now going to cut one out. I'll just cut one out so that you can see what I'm doing. So what I'm doing is cutting very close to my sewing, but you don't want to cut your stitching. And just follow that all the way around. So some nice little sharp scissors are quite good for this. And uh, I've used this grey thread on the green, which doesn't stand out a lot. So some fairly good lighting is helpful as well. So there I've cut one blade out already. And as you can see, this is now a wonderful blade of grass. When we pop it in our um, lock gate, we can change it and do all sorts of things with it, and it's going to be very effective. Now, just for now, I would suggest that we keep them straight because they'll be easier to sew in to the gate as well. So I've already done quite a lot of my grass ahead of time. I've used that yellowy color with green. I've got the different greens and things there. So I've made about 15 blades of grass. As I said, it's up to you how many you make. But that's how we make the grass. 